First of all, vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone. It's a steroid hormone. You don't have to take vitamin D in in your diet. The question is, are those diseases associated or caused by low vitamin D levels? So therefore, low vitamin D is unlikely to be causal, except in a disease like Rickets. Supplementation with vitamin D doesn't even fix osteoporosis, which is one of the commonest indicators in a misguided way the doctors give it. There's several papers on that. If your vitamin D levels drop because of the disease, then fixing the vitamin D levels just doesn't fix the problem. Think. Think. Empower yourself with knowledge, doctor or patient. Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis, and today we are going to speak about vitamin D. <laughs> First of all, vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone. It's a steroid hormone. In other words, vitamin D, uh, uh, vitamins by definition are essential to human survival. In other words, they have to be consumed from the outside in. They are not made in the human body. Vitamin D is a series of about five different products, vitamins one, uh, D1 to D5, of which vitamin D2 and D3 are important in humans, in humans, but they're actually not a vitamin. They were so called because they were first measured in children who had rickets, which is um, where they're not able to form their bones properly because of a lack of vitamin D. And when they gave those kids vitamin D, they found their bones improved. But vitamin D is actually um, a hormone, part of the steroid hormone complex, very, very similar in the same category as testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, the, stero the adrenal hormones, um, thyroid hormones T3, T4, is vitamin D3. Vitamin D is called cholecalciferol. And here's the interesting thing. All of those steroid hormones, including vitamin D3, has as a common precursor cholesterol. In fact, if you look at the shape of a cholesterol molecule and you look at the shape of a vitamin D, uh, D molecule, they're almost identical. You can see the subtle changes. And they go through a series of enzymatic changes from, from cholesterol to vitamin D. And that is primarily happens in the deeper layer of the skin. And as part of that process in the manufacture of vitamin D, you need sunlight as one of those steps in the process. So you don't have to take vitamin D in in your diet. It is only conditionally essential. The human body produces it very effectively, and yet it requires a decent amount of cholesterol, both my, which and cholesterol is made in the body as well as consumed to make adequate levels of vitamin D as well as sunlight. But you can get by without the consumption of vitamin D. However, it is conditionally essential in most people in that you do need to take some in. Come back to that in a second. One other concept to understand about the manufacture of vitamin D. If the majority of vitamin D is produced in the human body and it comes from cholesterol to go downstream, the hormone insulin blocks the very first enzyme that converts or that transforms cholesterol into downstream vitamin D. So high insulin, high chronically high levels of insulin blocks the production of vitamin D. That's going to be cri a critically important fact as we go through this. Now, the other part about vitamin D, if you're going to take it in your diet, it occurs in many things, animals and plants, mushrooms, any plants that see sunlight, but particularly mushrooms that see UV light, fish, eggs, all are very rich in vitamin D. And almost all people that are on a broad diet get adequate vitamin D in their mouth. However, in the standard American diet, that vitamin D is often not absorbed. Why? Because vitamins A, D, E, K are fat-soluble vitamins. They have to be absorbed together with fat. And if you take them aside from fat, or if you're eating a vegetarian diet that does not contain a lot of fat, you're not able to absorb it. 
But if you eat some salmon, if you eat a whole egg, including the yolk, you're going to absorb that vitamin D into your bloodstream. The next thing is that vitamin D is actually not an active form. Even if it's D2 or D3 that's taken in, it is not active. It has to be activated by hydroxylation, first in the liver and then in the kidney. And if those two organs are not working properly, you're sitting with a bunch of pre-hormone that is not biologically active. So to understand the pathway of vitamin D and where it comes from and why it's necessary is so important. Okay, But we discovered it in rickets in children, which was one disease, and we've overwhelmingly focused on that disease, not the other impacts of the hormone vitamin D. The second part is this. Because vitamin D receptors occur in every nucleus, in every cell in the body, all the cells with nucleuses have vitamin D receptors, vitamin D does so much more than just bone function. Vitamin D is a critical immune regulator. It regulates cell prol proliferation. It affects tyrosone, tyrosone, bleh, excuse me, tyrosine uptake by the cells for thyroid hormone. It affects muscular strength, muscular repair. It affects every single cell in the human body. We've just focused on the bone side because that's what we saw where we discovered it. But it affects every cell in the human body. And therefore, when we look at low levels of vitamin D and we look at certain disease processes from depression to muscular pain uh, to immune uh, dysfunction to bone demineralization, the question is, are those diseases associated or caused by low vitamin D levels? So, because vitamin D affects every one of those systems, is vitamin D directly causing the problem? And if it is, supplementation will fix the problem. That simple. However, if it's just associated with it, in other words, if your vitamin D levels are part of the disease, are caused by the disease process, rather than vitamin D causing the disease process. Do you understand that? If your vitamin D levels drop because of the disease, then fixing the vitamin D levels it doesn't fix the problem. However, if low vitamin D levels cause the disease, then fixing vitamin D levels is going to fix the disease. Follow me along with that? Okay, so those are important precursors. Now, the way we therefore study that is that we don't know whether D is associated with the causal of disease. So if your vitamin D levels are measured low and we give vitamin D, it should fix the problem. In 2014, a guy by the, Bol uh, by the name of Boland uh, published a study in The Lancet, and there have been multiple studies since then. That was a, happened to be a very large meta-analysis that showed this, unfortunately. There is no evidence, zero evidence, that supplementation with vitamin D improves any of the diseases that are associated with or have been ascribed causal relationship. So therefore, low vitamin D is unlikely to be causal, except in a disease like rickets. Lo supplementation with vitamin D doesn't even fix osteoporosis, which is one of the commonest indicators in a misguided way the doctors give it. There's several papers on that. Because vitamin D doesn't cause the problem. Vitamin D is associated with the problem. The problem is chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption and insulin resistance with high levels of insulin. Which affect internal deep production and affect how the steroid hormones work in the human body. They don't work in isolation, they work as a group. So supplementation, whether you take it or not, is not going to fix the problem. So supplementing is fine. But if you don't understand what the root cause problem is and address the root cause problem, supplementation has no benefit. And how many people don't keep popping tons of vitamin D and their levels are still low and the symptoms are still there? Because they haven't fixed the problem. The way vitamin D works in the bones, it's a steroid hormone that binds to the nucleus receptor. And what it does is it affects the calcium in the bones because vitamin D enhances calcium and phosphate and magnesium uptake from the intestine. But the way that bones work is human bones become calcified and develop through about 25 to, eight, to 28 years of life. After 
late 20s, maybe early 30s, your bones cannot increase their calcium load. Your bones cannot increase their calcium load. But then, for a long period of time of your life, the question is, is your skeleton stable or does it become a source of calcium for the rest of the body? You can't add to the bank. Think of this. Think of, of, of growing your bones like working. When you're working, you save money and you save money and you save money. Then you retire. And then for a period of retirement, if you can live off your Social Security, you don't need to tap into the bone bank. And then if Social Security stops, now you have to tap into the bone bank. Or if you have no Social Security, you tap into that right away. So the way it works is up to about 25 to 28, you want to maximize bone growth. And yes, vitamin D has a role there, but there's enough without supplementation. And then for most of your life, if you have adequate calcium and magnesium and phosphate absorption from your intestine, where you are consuming it and facilitating uptake through vitamin D, then you don't have to tap into the bank. And then toward the end of your life, you tap into it a little bit. But you don't ever have to tap into that. That's the way vitamin D works in the bones. And vitamin D is also of value in terms of remodeling after fracture and that kind of thing. And it affects muscular strength and tendon repair as well as bone growth. But vitamin D has to be activated in the liver and the kidneys. And if the first hydroxylation step doesn't happen in the liver because your liver cells are sick, if you've got a fatty liver, you're not able to do that. You're not able to fix it. So activation by the liver and the kidneys is as important to the absorption of the hormone. And here's the statement from the Boland paper. I'm going to read it to you. No clear scientific justification exists for recommending supplementation for preventing the vitamin D spectrum of diseases. Boland et al. 2014, Lancet, a meta-analysis that has been buried, that has been buried by the doctors that overprescribe vitamin D. So understand that insulin blockade is the problem. Insulin blockade is the problem. Insulin blockade comes from chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. And if you're a chronically ex uh, excessive carbohydrate consumption consumer, you're probably not eating, eating enough saturated fat, so even your absorption of D is affected. But the D that you make inside of yourself, as long as you see some sunlight and you are insulin sensitive, will, will improve your muscle pain, improve your muscle repair, tendon repair, bone growth, hair loss, depression, immune system getting sick, and all the interplay with the other steroid hormones. So whether you take vitamin D or not, it doesn't really matter to me. But at least learn to critically think about what the issues are. Do your own research. Don't just listen to some knee-jerk person that tells you it's so good for you. And that applies equally to doctors as well as uh, um, patients. And the key thing is this. It doesn't matter if you take vitamin D or not. But if you're taking it and you think you're solving a problem, you're not. You're not solving why your vitamin D is low. And your vitamin D is low, not because you live in an endemically low D level place, but because you're not getting enough in your diet. And the reason you're not getting en enough in your diet and because you're not converting enough is because of your high carbohydrate, low fat diet. On an ultra-low carbohydrate, high-fat diet, where you do a little bit of physical activity in the sunlight, you will not have a vitamin D problem. Think. Think. Empower yourself with knowledge, doctor or patient. I hope this helps.